Well, hello and welcome everyone to this month Fireside Chat in honor of Black History Month. This month is a time of celebration of the contributions African Americans have made to this country and also a time to reflect on the continued struggle for racial justice and health equity. The Fireside Chats are brought to you by the Office of Community Outreach and Engagement at the Masonic Cancer Center at the University of Minnesota. The Office of Community Outreach and Engagement serves as a bridge between the Cancer Center and communities across the state of Minnesota. Our team's mission is to reduce the burden of cancer in Minnesota by engaging communities and providing them access to knowledge and information on the latest cancer research, cancer prevention, the importance of screening and early detection, treatment options, survivorship, as well as clinical research opportunities. My name is Amna Hussein. I am the Community Engagement Coordinator on our team. And on behalf of our team, thank you all so much for joining us today for a very important discussion about the role of race in cancer research and health outcomes. According to the American Cancer Society, African Americans have a higher cancer burden and face greater obstacles to cancer prevention, detection, treatment, and survival. In fact, in the United States, Black people have the highest death rate from cancer and the shortest survival compared to any other racial or ethnic group. I recently came across an article in the journal um, Nature that um, captured my attention entitled Let's Get Critical, Bringing Critical Race Theory into Cancer Research. This piece is written by our speaker today. In this article, Dr. Maya Robertson connects critical race theory to health outcomes in cancer research and analyzes how race consciousness and structural racism and systems of racial oppression continue to perpetuate and widen, widen health disparities amongst Black Americans. After reading this article, I knew we needed to bring Dr. Robertson in for a conversation this month. So now I have the distinct privilege and honor to introduce to you all our speaker today, Dr. Maya Robertson. Dr. Robertson is an assistant professor of health policy at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. Her research interests are in applying epidemiologic methods to health services research to promote health equity and using big data sets for Black people in the Southern United States. She is the principal investigator of a career development award entitled Centering Equity in Hereditary Breast and Ovarian Cancer Genetic Testing, a Mixed Method Study. This is funded by the American so Association for Cancer Research in partnership with Victoria's Secrets and Pelotina. Dr. Robertson earned her bachelor's degree in public health from Brown University and a master's of doctoral degrees um, and a master's and doctoral degrees in epidemiology from UNC Gillings School of Public Global Public Health, where she was a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Health Policy Researcher and Truman Scholar. Today, Dr. Robertson will discuss the role of critical race theory in health outcomes research with a reflection on historic processes, how historic processes have um, affected contemporary cancer research, specifically in precision oncology and on genetic and genomic services delivery. In addition, she will provide some key insights for how to center patient voice and health equity in cancer research. We will be recording today's session, so you can refer back to the recording on our YouTube page at Masonic Cancer Center. Before we begin, I would like our audience to get familiar with using the Q&A feature, which is gonna be located on the bottom of your Zoom window. During Dr. Robertson's presentation, please use the Q&A feature to submit your comments or questions. Dr. Robertson will be available to answer live questions later on in our program today. All right, so I won't take up any more of your time. I will now like to pass it over to Dr. Maya Robertson. Please take it away. Thank you so much, Amna, for that wonderful introduction. And I look forward to presenting in part today the uh, manuscript that you had referenced uh, in Nature of Youth Cancer and digging a little bit deeper into that specific piece. Uh, and so, as was noted, we're here to talk today about race, and I added racism as well uh, in cancer research. And to get started, I'd like to orient you to really the core question that guides my research program, which is who aren't we reaching with high quality cancer care and how do we reach them? And I would argue that whether you consider yourself a cancer health equity researcher or not, um, if you're in the space of cancer, uh, this is something that we should all be thinking about. Who aren't we reaching and how do we reach them? 
And so for me, this interest really came from this kind of quintessential figure in cancer research that I was first exposed to when I was an undergraduate. And so here in this figure, we have the mortality rate for breast cancer with the uh, mortality rate uh, per 100,000 on the y-axis uh, and uh, the calendar year on the x-axis <clears throat> split out by uh, several different groups, including Black, White, Hispanic, and Asian Pacific Islander. And there are many things that I get from this figure that has really served as the guiding motivation for my own career. First is that can, uh, breast cancer mortality has declined for everyone as the course, uh, over the course of time. We have gotten substantially, substantially better at treating breast cancer, particularly when it's caught in early stages. However, these declines have not been felt by all groups individually. And so while these declines have been experienced by all of the groups depicted in this picture, the mortality gap has actually widened between black and white women, particularly in the most recent years. Importantly, and we'll dig into this idea of race as a social construct, we can see actually in the 19, late 1970s and 1980s on the leftmost part of this figure that there actually wasn't a disparity. And to me, that really rejects this idea, among many other things, that there is not a biological uh, kind of conception of race, a pure biologic explanation for these disparities that we observe between Black women, breast cancer, and white women. Because if that were the case, we fundamentally would not see this overlap in an earlier year. Rather, this gap suggests to me, and the, the trends in this gap suggest to me, that as we have gotten better at treating breast cancer, particularly over the last several decades, these, experience, these uh, cancer innovations have not been experienced by all populations. And that really serves as the core motivation for the work that I do uh, empirically. But I want to jump into uh, some conceptual work, taking a couple of steps back. Uh, as was noted, the theme of this fireside chat is race and racism and cancer research. But what is race? Let's first level set there to make sure that we're talking about the same thing. And I really appreciate uh, this definition of race from one of my grad school colleagues uh, and team, where they define race as a fluid, relational, contextually specific social construct often derived by assigning social meaning to observable characteristics like skin tone and hair texture. And so this is this whole idea of race as a social construct. But what, it, what does that mean at its core? What is race as a social construct? I think it's also helpful in this space to talk about what do we mean by a social construct. And so broadly, a social construct is this concept or category that has socially, uh, socially and culturally mediated meaning. There are concepts that generate their meaning through social and cultural worldviews. And so one example of this, in my own work, I focus predominantly on Black and African American populations in the United States. And what Black and African American means, uh, means something different in the United States versus South America, versus uh, the, across the African diaspora and other uh, countries such as Europe or other continents such as Europe. And so this idea of who counts as Black really has, as is noted in this definition, socially and culturally mediated meaning. Black is not any one thing. It is this cultural global construct. And so diving back into that definition offered by some of my colleagues about what are some kind of socially mediated definitions of race, I appreciate this uh, table that they uh, adapted to talk about some of these things. And I'll focus on three specific dimensions that I think are most prominent in cancer research. First is this idea of racial identity, someone's self-identifications that's not necessarily constrained to check boxes. Uh, so open-ended self-identification questions. And so you, if you asked me, Maya Roberson, how I racially identify, I would say that I identify as a Black African-American woman. In addition, uh, we also have categories of perceived race, uh, and <clears throat> this can be the race that others perceive you to be. So if someone looked at you or looked at a participant, how they are uh, racially categorized rather than being asked. Uh, and then there's also the flip side of this, 
which is how uh, others perceive you to be the reflected race, the race you believe others assume you to be. And why this matters in the context of cancer research in particular is because we don't always ask people's self-identification, which in from a social epidemiology perspective may be seen as a gold standard. Rather, sometimes we're relying on data that are captured for us. These may be racial identifications of folks uh, as they're racialized when they walk into a clinic by front desk staff, uh, or things of that nature. And so to me in cancer research and research more broadly, it's really important to know what type of race are you grappling with? And for many individuals, these three different categorizations, the uh, subjective racial self-identification, the race that others believe you to be, and the race that you believe others assume you to be are one in the same and are exactly the same. But this gets very messy and convoluted when we have uh, people ascribing race to other folks based on heuristics like phenotype, how they appear, and other culturally relevant factors. And so it's deeply important to know what exactly is the racial category that you're working with or the, the idea, conception of race that you are working with and being honest about that. As someone who works a lot with big data sets, I wish that I always had uh, self-identified race, but sometimes it's the case, particularly for medical clinic-based data, that it is much more likely to be uh, the second one that some staff member assigned a racial category to a participant or to someone who ended up in the data set based on how they appeared. And so I really want wanted to spend some time here uh, because I know that race as a social construct is a term that gets thrown around a lot uh, without a whole lot of meaning or context about what that actually means. <clears throat> and so now that we've had an opportunity to level set about what race and the social construct of race is, I want to dig into what is critical race theory and what is it not? Uh, this is a topic that has garnered a lot of media attention uh, over the last year plus, particularly in the last weeks to months, um, as we uh, see in the popular news media debates over the AP African American Studies curriculum. And you may ask what that has to do with cancer research. And I would argue that it has everything to do with cancer. And so these are some of the headlines. Uh, that I've been alluding to over the last year, um, seeing very charged language when referring to critical race theory. So seeing headlines like critical race theory being used to pr uh, promote atrocities uh, in the state where I've been residing, Tennessee, there has been a lot of uh, in-person physical rallies uh, around anti-critical race theory <clears throat> sorts of sentiments. Uh, Tennessee passed a ban related to the teaching of critical race theory uh, in 2021, and I think most recently what's garnered particularly a lot of spotlight uh, is what has been happening in the state of Florida related to the uh, controversial bill banning critical race theory in schools. And what's happening in Florida, I think, is an, an important uh, example to pull out because uh, the actual legislation that's been passed goes well above and beyond actual textbook critical race theory, which I'll define in the slides to come, and goes on to talk about any sort of discussion around diversity, equity, and inclusion, about structural racism, uh, and those sorts of things, which are can be elements of critical race theory, but are not in and of themselves critical race theory. And so, uh, there have been a wide sweeping legislative action, state legislative actions related to critical race theory and the dis overall discussion of race in classrooms, uh, both at the K through 12 level and also the public university level. This was one of the most recent maps that I could find, uh, which is actually from uh, about a year ago. Uh, and so this does not reflect the latest changes in Florida, uh, where we can see that the, uh, in this particular case, the states represented in blue have signed laws into a uh, place that ban the teaching of critical race theory and other discussions of race and racism in classrooms. The purple states have pending legislation and in uh, this figure, the red states uh, had legislation introduced, but it did not pass. And so, uh, as I had noted in Tennessee, uh, in 2021, a uh, legislation was passed to limit how teachers can discuss racism and sexism in K through 12 classrooms. 
And so again, in Tennessee, the bill that was passed did not actually mention critical race theory at all. It talked more generally about discussions of race uh, and racism and how they cannot be included in classroom discussions. And this distinction is important because critical race theory is a very specific thing. Uh, however, how it's been discussed in the lay media has been all encompassing uh, to, discuss, to have critical race theory mean uh, any sort of conversation around race or racism in classrooms. That's not what it means and it's not what it was intended to mean. Uh, but it's become kind of this colloquial shorthand to pass policy across the U.S. And so digging into what is critical race theory and what is it not, uh, critical race theory originated in the legal and policy sector in the 1970s and 1980s. And it was developed as a means to understand how systemic racism <clears throat> influences public policy and legal outcomes. And so one of the prominent uh, examples of what critical race theory helps us explain is redlining. Uh, and redlining was this discriminatory mortgage lending practice that occurred primarily in the 1930s and 40s all across United States metros uh, that restricted where, uh, black, in particular, Black and uh, certain other groups of color uh, residents could purchase homes. Um, and so this is on the right, a map of Nashville, uh, where the red line districts are those who are deemed most hazardous. Um, and people were uh, literally barred from living, Black people in particular were literally barred from living in the uh, quote unquote safer neighborhoods, uh, the non-redline districts. And so this has resulted in substantial segregation that we see across the United States. And even though redlining is no longer uh, codified into law, it is illegal, we still see the manifestations of segregation in across US metros. Uh, and so critical race theory under, helps us understand the long lasting legacy and impact that a structurally racist policy like redlining can have. Because if you were to look at the map of the uh, distribution of Black people in Nashville or many other redlined metros in the United States, they look very similar now uh, in terms of the density of Black folks compared to the red areas shown in this map, the historically redlined districts. And so these sorts of structural, structurally racist policies have profound impacts for generational wealth, for mobility, uh, for access to schools, particularly public schools, given the uh, tie between public school funding and property values. And so it's really getting at how this is a structure that manifests fundamentally racist outcomes that goes on to reinforce inequities across time. And so that critical race theory is an anchor for much of my work. And one of the, uh, I think, applications of critical race theory that has occurred in the broader health sciences is the public health critical race methodology developed by Chandra Ford and Collins at Rewin in 2010, which is depicted in this figure on the right. And so in their theory, they talk about, or in the public health critical race methodology, they talk about this overall idea of race consciousness, the idea that race and racism shape everything that touches public health and health sciences. And they go on to talk about four key focus areas that relate to uh, key domains within the foundational critical race theory and tie them into outcomes in public health. And so these focus areas are the contemporary patterns of race relations, knowledge production, conceptualization and measurement and action. And there's an interrelated relationship between these four focus areas with each other and also with the 10 core principles that you see outlined in the bullets uh, in the figure on the right. And in the piece that I'm about to dive into that I wrote uh, that was published in Nature Reviews Cancer last year, I took the public health critical race methodology and I applied it specifically to the cancer research enterprise, thinking all the way from <clears throat> basic translational science through population health research, how does critical race theory and the domains of the public health critical race methodology shape how we foundationally conduct cancer research. 
And so in this piece uh, that I wrote, starting with the same idea and kind of conception that of race consciousness where race and racism shape everything foundationally in the cancer research enterprise, going down into the contemporary patterns of race relations, where we think about the existence of the systematic exclusion of the global majority in cancer research. And what I mean by this is that the vast bodies of evidence in cancer research are primarily derived from European descended populations. And European descended populations just statistically do not make up the majority of people who inhabit this planet. Uh, and so I use the, uh, the term global majority very intentionally to mean that our cancer research is fundamentally derived from non-representative samples of the folks uh, who, who live on this planet. Also relating to contemporary patterns of race relations is recognizing the mistrust of academic and medical institutions from marginalized backgrounds. Uh, it's frequently thought that medical mistrust is rooted in historical issues. Uh, the commonly cited one is the US syphilis study, uh, colloquially referred to as the Tuskegee syphilis study. And that's why, for example, Black folks don't trust uh, medical systems, but you can search headlines and see that there are many contemporary issues related to how institutions broadly defined, particularly medical institutions, treat Black and other populations of color. We saw this particularly laid bare in the COVID-19 pandemic. And so understanding mistrust and the trustworthiness of medical and academic institutions as a fundamental contributor or fundamental derivative, I'm sorry, of the contemporary patterns of race relations that go on to shape the uh, cancer research enterprise. Moving through and thinking about how the contemporary patterns of race relations relates to knowledge production. And so as I had noted and kind of opened with and talking about this work is that the vast majorities of our research is derived from European descended population who does not represent the global majority that then goes on to shape the current bodies of evidence in cancer research. And this goes through the entire cancer continuum. And so this uh, includes uh, GWAS, genome-wide association studies, it includes our clinical trials, it includes uh, our current clinical guidelines are primarily derived from individuals of European ancestry, which again, do not represent uh, the United States and it certainly does not represent the globe. Um, and so uh, I had seen some of the questions that were submitted uh, in advance and I uh, just want to pull one of them out here that someone had asked if uh, these sorts of issues are global, if critical race theory has global applications or if racial disparities are global. Uh, and anti-Blackness and structural racism are global constructs. And so in particular, because of this uh, systematic exclusion of the global majority from our contemporary body of cancer research, contemporary and historic body of cancer research, I would say that yes, these issues are in fact global and certainly have ramifications far beyond just the United States. This idea of knowledge production also requires a willingness to iterate on methods to acknowledge that the way that we have been doing things in cancer research has not been inclusive by design and that we need to really revisit the tools and things that we do in this space to get back to that question that I had opened with who are we missing with high quality cancer research or who are we missing with high quality cancer care and how do we get them? Moving down the line to conceptualization and measurement, uh, this gets into not conflating socially constructed race with ancestry. So going back to that figure that I had shown early on about the diverging mortality difference between black and white women with breast cancer, uh, really understanding the sociocultural dynamics at play there uh, and not automatically jumping to biological essentialism, reinforcing biological ideas of race. As I had noted, uh, race is a social construct with different meaning uh, in different parts of the world and also across time. And so being very careful and very explicit in what we mean by race. Additionally, considering intersecting systems of oppression affecting cancer research, and so in this space, I think about the interlocking intersecting systems of structural racism and colonialism, 
and how that relates to how we might ethically conduct and be more inclusive of different populations across the world to make sure that our cancer research is more representative uh, of various populations. And then finally, thinking about action, putting all of this together to think very creatively and cre critically about inclusive study recruitment, to think about the equity implications of new cancer-related innovations and how our, uh, the fact that we've gotten better at treating cancer has really reinforced or widened inequities. I showed an example of breast cancer because that it's what most of my research focuses on. However, this has been seen across cancers as well, where the better that we get at treating certain cancers, we see inequities widen. And so considering equity from the outset as innovation is developed and diffused out into communities to make sure that we're not constantly playing a game of catch up. To move beyond describing disparities, in particular, and to think about how do we move from uh, description to action to really close these inequities, and then also the engagement of stakeholders. Uh, I frequently consider myself an, uh, an expert in cancer research, but folks with uh, who have lived experience with cancer are experts in cancer too, in a different and important way that is important to include those voices that nobody knows anything better about the lived experience with cancer than those who have actually had it and making sure that those folks are engaged at all steps of the process. And so to be a little bit more concrete about some of the theoretical stuff that I had just discussed on the previous slide, this was a paper that was published in 2021 um, by Brittany Lord and colleagues, where um, they really uh, hold into, uh, at the same time, this idea of social construction of race and also um, how we think about cancer genetics and genomics. And so in this figure, uh, they depict the distribution of uh, individuals included in the Cancer Genome Atlas, which is a pretty foundational study for uh, GWAS studies in the cancer space. And the vast majority of folks uh, sampled in this study were uh, from the United States, primarily uh, European ancestry uh, descended, uh, and very few folks from uh, outside of the US. And in this manuscript, in this paper, uh, Lord and colleagues talk about how we can hold both biological determinants of health and social determinants of health at the same time without reinforcing biological essentialism of race. And so here they talk about cancer predispositions and subpopulations, potentially inherited cancer mutations or, or other sorts of genetics and genomics related factors. And so here they propose thinking at the same time about biological determinants of health and also social determinants of health, that we can hold these things in parallel and they don't necessarily have to be in conflict with each other. And that it's not one or the other, that we need to think about them at the same time. In the translational research space, thinking in parallel about genetic ancestry of admixed populations. And so as time goes on uh, and populations become more and more genetically admixed, acknowledging uh, that as we move forward, while at the same time identifying and mitigating structural racism and acknowledging its existence and how it per uh, is perpetuated throughout the cancer research enterprise. Moving through clinical application decision-making, having diversity competent underlying uh, GWAS studies, very inclusive GWAS studies so that the genomes that are being included are more reflective of uh, a global society and an increasingly diverse society. And at the same time, thinking about uh, diversity competent research as well, thinking about this idea of how can we hold at the same time uh, patterns and uh, genetically uh, certain genetic ancestry groups while acknowledging that race is a social construct. And then finally, uh, putting all of that together, thinking about those things in parallel to really promote health justice through reframing precision medicine. And so just to bring this piece home about, I talked very high level and theoretically about how the cancer research enterprise is structurally racist and has gone on to contribute to inequities across uh, different uh, populations. Um, this is, I believe, a really prominent example of that. And so uh, this was uh, some media reporting on a study done by one of my colleagues at Vanderbilt uh, several years ago in 2015. Uh, related to BRCA mutation frequencies in African-American populations. And 
Previously, it was thought that BRCA inherited cancer mutations either didn't happen very frequently uh, in black women, or maybe uh, they uh, had a slightly similar prevalence to white women. Um, but the general perception, both to patients and to providers, was that black women were not primarily at risk for BRCA mutations. Uh, and this work had found out that Black women actually had higher rates of these mutations than previously thought. Uh, and this work has definitely evolved over time as well as our understanding of things like triple negative breast cancer have been refined. And uh, while we haven't quite landed on an exact prevalence of BRCA mutations, it's now known that Black women have at least the same frequency of BRCA mutations as white women, if not potentially higher. And so this has had long lasting impacts on uh, the delivery of breast cancer care, both preventive and treatment care, particularly for black women, where now, again, as I alluded to, as, uh, as I was discussing earlier, that we're in a place of playing catch up because previously, because black women were not included in the original studies uh, and other women of color as well, were not included in the original studies where these genes were found, we had kind of bumbled along thinking that because we didn't see them, they were not common in this population. And then later found out that that actually was not the case. Uh, and for those uh, who aren't familiar with BRCA mutations, uh, for people without cancer who have these mutations, uh, they have an 80% chance of developing breast cancer, <clears throat> lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. And for those folks who uh, don't have cancer, then they can take, if they know that they have a mutation, they can take preventive measures like getting a bilateral mastectomy and getting a, an oophorectomy uh, because they also have increased risk of ovarian cancer. So if we are misunderstanding the frequency of these sorts of mutations and populations, this has impacts on who has uh, access to that sort of care. BRCA mutations can also affect care delivery, particularly in the metastatic setting related to the usage of targeted therapies. And so there are different points along the cancer care continuum where this goes on to have pretty uh, prominent impacts that will reinforce health inequities. Another example in the genomic space was related to the Oncotype DX21 gene recurrence score that very similarly uh, black women and other women of color were not included uh, in the original uh, studies and trials where this was developed and tested. Uh, and then it was found that this uh, tool mispredicts the risk of recurrence in black women. <clears throat> this is another space of trying to play catch up to increase the accuracy in this population uh, and also potentially mitigate harm if it is not uh, is accurate. And so again, thinking about how this started from foundationally, who was included in the original research where these studies were de designed, thinking all the way through the implementation of the tools of genetic and genomic testing to really uh, be thoughtful, to make sure that we are not uh, creating greater inequities uh, between groups as we get better and more refined at treating cancer. And again, I use breast cancer specific examples since that's where most of my work is anchored in. But there are other examples that can be pulled from other cancers uh, where we can find similar sorts of new innovations being introduced, Black people and other folks of color not being included in the source populations where these things were tested. And then a post hoc, we were trying to figure out how to get folks equitable access to care. And so while I have been uh, anchoring in breast cancer, please know that this is not, these issues are not unique to breast cancer uh, and really cross cut cancers and the cancer care continuum and the cancer research enterprise. And so shifting gears uh, in my remaining moments uh, with y'all just briefly before opening up for broader uh, question and answer, I would say we need to consider equity across multiple dimensions. And so one of the key tenets of critical race theory is thinking about this idea of reflexivity and understanding uh, your own blind spots and where um, you might not have been uh, as inclusive or have done things uh, as you had um, as you had wanted to. And so for me in reflecting on the larger body of my research that I've been uh, producing over the last several years, realize that I've foundationally excluded patients with metastatic breast cancer. Um, <clears throat> there are a whole host of reasons. 
uh, for this. Uh, some of them justified, some of them not. I think it's honestly quite common for us in cancer research to exclude folks in metastatic cancer. But I really sat with that uh, and thought about my work, where these folks could have been included, maybe as a sub-analysis uh, or definitely didn't have to be excluded. Perhaps it was hypothesis of generating rather than hypothesis testing. Uh, and thinking about uh, how folks with metastatic cancer are disproportionately likely to be people of color and specifically black folks and how that has an impact on my broader uh, research. And so as part of that process of reflexivity and thinking back to that original question of who are we missing with high quality cancer care and how do we get to them, I wanted to partner with metastatic breast cancer led organizations to understand the patient voice in this particular space. Uh, and so over the last year, I had been uh, conducting a qualitative study partnered with two metastatic uh, led organizations called Project Life and GRASP. Project Life is a virtual wellness community for people living with, uh, with metastatic breast cancer and their loved ones that provides free programming uh, to individuals in this population. And as part of these qualitative interviews, we wanted to understand policy issues and broader issues uh, affecting people with MBC, with metastatic breast cancer, and the role of patient-created initiatives. And in conducting this study, um, talked to 36 uh, really uh, wonderful women living with metastatic breast cancer from all races, um, but uh, had included uh, a number of women of color and really learned a lot about their experience living uh, with metastatic breast cancer. And so how this ties into, how these interviews tie into precision medicine, I talked with uh, one young Latina woman who was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer in her 30s. And in the interview, she said to me, so I did ask my oncologist for, uh, so I did ask my oncologist. So for almost two years, I was taking letrozole and it really wasn't doing its job. Why wouldn't the insurance cover a liquid biopsy of some sort? And so in this conversation, in this dialogue, this uh, particular uh, interviewee that I had talked with uh, was expressing concern about potential access to precision medicine related uh, technologies like a liquid biopsy. And liquid biopsies still at this stage are relatively controversial in terms of insurance coverage, utility, um, FDA approval and things of that nature. But I think that this quote is illustrative of another space where our innovation is not keeping track with our policy and patients are suffering. And so in this particular case, it turns out that a, a particular uh, genomic test was helpful for this patient to help identify a drug that she would respond to better. Uh, but instead, she took she was on medication, experiencing progression uh, for two years because she couldn't get coverage for the tests that her provider had recommended that they, that they thought would benefit. And so holding at the same time uh, need for evidence-based innovation and keeping track of our policies to make sure that patients have access to things that can benefit them, particularly patients from marginalized backgrounds. Another young Black woman that I had talked to as part of this uh, investigation was diagnosed de novo with triple negative metastatic breast cancer at the age 36, talked to me around the uh, uh, clinical trials process and having an interest in enrolling in a clinical trial. And in this interview, she said to me, clinical trials should be introduced as a treatment option when we're diagnosed. And so I have to admit that I, it wasn't immediately offered. It was like, hey, we're going to try this traditional chemotherapy. And so here we hear very frequently about, oh, how do we get more Black people, more, other, more uh, additional people of color enrolled in clinical trials? They're not interested, all of these sorts of things. And here was a case of a woman who absolutely was interested, uh, but it was not something that was raised with her uh, during her care. She went on to say, so in speaking with my peers, they had similar experiences where they were not provided with all of the options until they advocated for themselves. And so in this particular space, this participant had leveraged peer networks to help understand the clinical trials process to be able to go on to have a more informed conversation with her oncologist. But I want to emphasize that in this space, the onus was on her and her peer group. Uh, and so as we think about the importance of diversifying our research, particularly our clinical trials, we need to be very thoughtful uh, about how we do that. 
to make sure that uh, patients and participants are kept informed, uh, but also the onus of education is not on them. And quite honestly, people living with cancer and particularly metastatic cancers have great ideas for how to diversify clinical trials. And it's on us as cancer researchers to listen to them. Just in closing here, uh, as part of the uh, as part of these interviews um, that I was just discussing, I had asked each participant how they would very explicitly how they would reimagine metastatic breast cancer care if anything were on the table. And even with that kind of broad framing, if anything were possible, they these were the broad buckets of things that the uh, participants had suggested. Thinking about things like organized referral processes for non-oncology care, like mental health, sexual health, and palliative care, the need for metastatic specific support services within the care setting. And so many, if not all of the participants had turned online to learn more about their condition. And some of that uh, information that they uh, can gather online uh, may be great, may lead them down uh, a very dangerous rabbit hole. To have patient connections to psychosocial aspects of care, including social work and patient navigation, and to have streamlined processes for identifying and enrolling in clinical trials. And I put these domains here to say that these are things that we talk about very frequently in the context of research and are also the ideas that are important to patients themselves. And as I had noted on the previous slide, patients have really great ideas for how we can improve cancer care delivery. And I think it's on us and deeply important to incorporate those voices into how we think about more equitable cancer care. And so just a couple of things that I hope you're taking away from your time with me today. Uh, I believe that the cancer research enterprise is structurally inequitable and has contributed substantially to cancer health inequities. That evaluating population level trends in genetic and genomic testing is crucial uh, and above and beyond that, understanding back to that foundational question, who are we missing with high quality cancer care and how do we reach them? And that patient and community engagement can help us more thoughtfully and thoroughly identify gaps and also potential solutions. As I had noted earlier, Nobody knows uh, the living experience with cancer better than those who have been through it. And so it is on us to more meaningfully incorporate their voices into cancer research uh, from all across the cancer continuum. Thank you. Dr. Robertson, wow, thank you so much for such an impactful presentation. I mean, your commitment to just the work that you do and really closing the health inequity gap that we see amongst Black Americans is truly inspirational and moving. So thank you so much for all the amazing work that you do. So we've had quite a few questions that have been submitted just during your presentation today, as well as um, prior to um, today from the registration. So we'll get right to it. But before we do, it's not a fireside chat without a fire. So let me just get our fire going. Okay. So um, we'll just kind of start off by what was submitted so far. So um, someone really appreciated you speaking about um, perceived race versus self-identifying and noted that this problem is it's seen in um, our clinics and it's problematic when analyzing our data. So what ways can organizations and clinics work to encourage clinicians and providers not to complete racial demographics with perceived belief on a patient's race? Great. Thank you for this question. You know, I think that this is where we really have to work with our, our colleagues working in health systems. Um, and perhaps this is where the, the person uh, who was asking this question had uh, come from in that, uh, you know, I think coming armed with data and evidence is helpful. I mean, now there have been uh, several studies that have looked at, uh, in particular, the discordance between how people self-identify uh, and people's perceived race kind of in these sorts of settings. And it is especially problematic, these sorts of, uh, this discordance is especially problematic for indigenous folks. Uh, it is especially problematic for uh, Hispanic and Latinx folks as well. And so there is evidence that we are um, 
not, <laughs> not categorizing folks uh, as they would self-identify, which as we think about uh, health inequities and, and reaching the, the populations that we want to reach is critically uh, important. I mean, I can't project to be an expert on infrastructure related issues, since I know that sometimes it, it comes down to that, but I think that um, kind of poking where you can and really keeping at it about where we can ask for self-identified race, that that is preferable. I mean, you know, sometimes <clears throat> folks don't like to use self-identified race because they're worried that it might be too many categories or, or things like that, but it, it's honestly better to have it be someone's reflection of their own identity to make sure that we're reaching the populations that we want to reach and that they're uh, experience is, is captured adequately. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't have concrete solutions other than there is data out there to support that there is discordance uh, and that can be helpful for making these sorts of arguments. Great, thank you for that. Um, so another attendee um, asks about how we can work against um, biological essentialism in research and medical school and beyond. And what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, this is a, a great question and uh, something that I have thought a lot about uh, in being uh, in a medical school and someone who has uh, had the privilege and honor of teaching medical students over this last year. Uh, and I think that we first need to acknowledge that we're working a little bit upstream, quite honestly, that uh, you know, one of the things that I have had students say to me in my classroom is, what I'm learning here with you, Dr. Roberson, is different than what I'm learning in my uh, in my medical school classes. And so, I mean, I think it starts at that foundational curriculum. So there isn't um, that tension, but understanding that the uh, our medical colleagues who are uh, also teaching these students went to school where these went to school at a time when these conversations weren't happening necessarily. Um, and so, holding those uh, at the same time at Vanderbilt, um, we've done a lot of work into incorporating these sorts of discussion into the main medical student curriculum. And so, it's not just. Um, electives or, or things like that. And I think that's important that all medical students get exposed to this and not just have it be something off to the side. And one of the things that I was saying, part of the reason why that happened and why it was so successful here at Vanderbilt is because the students pushed for it. It started with them. They were really hungry for this content. They wanted to be able to reconcile uh, these sorts of things that they were learning. Uh, and so I think really listening to the students as well and, and leaning in on that to kind of galvanize this change that is needed. I mean, it's going to be slow and generational, as I had noted, because of this uh, difference between who is teaching and who is receiving the information. But I think that uh, I, I'm optimistic that we can we can get there. Great. So how do you see stress exacerbating the rates of um, cancer in the Black community? Um, this attendee noted a, a Canadian psychiatrist, Dr. Gaber Mate, who states that these um, same statistics with an emphasis on the mind-body connection and that Western science tends to ignore that and the higher rates of stress that women and people of color are subject to are in fact exacerbating some of the cancer disparities that we see. Thank you for this question. I mean, this is a bit outside of the scope of my research area, um, but I, I will say that I mean, we know just baseline physiologically that stress can cause epigenetic and physiologic changes in the body. And there has been a wide body of evidence, uh, thinking about foundational scholar David Williams, uh, related to how structural racism goes on to uh, really cause these real physiologic health outcomes uh, in, in folks. And so I think it, it absolutely does uh, exacerbate <clears throat> people's cancer outcomes. Uh, I can't speak to how it exacerbates rates of uh, cancer in the Black community because I am not a cancer etiologist, but I thank you for that question. Okay, so we're just getting through these. <laughs> There's so many of them. Um, so I appreciate you so much, Dr. Robertson. So how can we engage more participants of color in clinical research? Um, what are some recruitment stat strategies that you can share? I mean, uh, this goes back to something that I had 
mentioned and asking people of color how they want to be engaged is, I mean, it, I don't mean to sound trite, but that that's really what it comes down to. It's building relationships, is being out there in community with folks. It's knowing what uh, patient and community-led organizations are working in this space and asking how you can lend your skills to them. I mean, the metastatic qualitative study that I had presented on, that's how that uh, relationship was built. I had uh, approached, grasped the one organization and said, you know, I have these skills, uh, I have these interests that I would like to lend to an organization working in metastatic breast cancer. You know, I'm interested in health equity and uh, they matched me to Project Life and that's how that work was conducted. And so approaching it with a level of humility and uh, I, I don't know the answers and I, I don't pretend to, I really believe that the answers are within the folks who are most affected. And so to go out um, both empirically and also informally um, and engage with folks <clears throat> about how to uh, get more people involved in, in clinical research. I mean, one of the things kind of above and beyond what I had presented on today is that I believe very firmly in being a good steward of the community that I live in, like physically, geographically, um, when I'm not Maya Roberson, the professor, when I'm just Maya Roberson, the community member, um, understanding the folks that I am living around with no research or professional gain. I mean, the, those sorts of things, I think, are the ways that we can go on to build better research because we don't see ourselves as researchers as separate from the community. We are within community. Um, and I don't uh, mean that to mean like, oh, just Black people are people of color. I mean, we are all part of different communities, either anchored in geography or uh, alumni of certain places or a certain professional societies or things like that. Like community means a lot of different things. And so thinking about what does it mean for you as an individual to engage in community and how can you do that authentically? And then I think that those sorts of things start to follow and then you start gaining insights about how folks want to be engaged in the conduct of, of research. I love that. Thank you so much. And work with your cancer center COE office as well, because they, uh, uh, these <laughs> folks work very extraordinarily, extraordinarily hard. So if you don't know wonderful folks like Omna and uh, if you were tuning in from outside the University of Minnesota, I mean, think the addition of our Office of Outreach and Community Engagement from the NCI was such a foundational important move to really signify uh, how much equity and community broadly defined matters. And so I, I do think that engagement with those sorts of offices and entities that were created for a reason uh, mm -hmm. can be uh, particularly critical and, and is critical, not can be. Mm -hmm. I agree. Thank you so much for that, that plug. Um, so we are boots on the ground and, and we are here for the communities that we serve. Um, so another question was asked specifically about um, Vanderbilt and, and what um, you're doing currently to recognize and measure um, or to recognize and measure um, Black and Hispanic women to measure if Black and Hispanic women are getting high quality cancer care for metastatic breast cancer. So what exactly is Vanderbilt currently doing? Yeah, so um, I am not a clinician and most of my work is actually focused outside of patients who are seen at Vanderbilt um, intentionally because the folks who are seen at Vanderbilt do not reflect the broader Nashville or Tennessee population. But the question is fair uh, nonetheless. And so one of the things that is being done broadly that I think is critically important uh, and I'm not sure the extent to which it's being done um, systematically across NCI designated cancer centers is that every single patient diagnosed with um, metastatic breast cancer gets next generation tumor sequencing, uh, which is in recommendation with the guidelines. Uh, however, recent literature has shown kind of nationally that there's a big gap in making sure that all patients with metastatic breast cancer are getting their tumor sequence so that they can get access to the targeted therapies. And the reason why this happened at Vanderbilt, quite honestly, is because we had a champion of, um, of metastatic breast cancer, of someone who cared a lot about tumor testing. Um, and it shouldn't necessarily rely on a single person like taking this up in a cancer center to, to uh, ensure that that 
happens. And so because there is, a, you know, I'm not an implementation scientist, so know a, a little bit about uh, implementation, thinking about the implementation of that particular intervention of uh, tumor sequencing, universal tumor sequencing for folks with metastatic breast cancer. I think a lot can be learned from uh, how do we make sure that everybody is being reached um, with the new innovations that are uh, impacting the sorts of care that folks receive. So we'll shift gears just a little bit. Um, sure. Can you share top of your head just kind of the percentage of cancer research studies currently that are being conducted that are focused on specifically addressing some of the disparities gaps that we see? I know there's, as you kind of mentioned, there's a lot of, um, we are really good at describing the disparities that we see. And so um, do you kind of have that number top of mind? I don't have it off the top of my head, um, but I will say that the NIH has a really great tool that I've used in my classes, actually, um, where you can uh, go in and either look NIH-wide or at specific institutes of what percentage of studies have specific tags, so like health disparities, health inequities, things like that. You can also go in and see um, the overall, at a given institute, the overall like median percentage of uh, Black people enrolled in, in studies, of uh, Latina folks involved uh, enrolled in studies, of Asian folks enrolled in studies. And this isn't just clinical trials or things like that. It's NA, any NIH human subjects research. And so these sorts of things are knowable. And I would encourage you to look at the NIH's website for more information about that. Great. Thank you for that. So um, what specifically can healthcare providers do to ensure that their patients are receiving equitable care? Yeah, you know, I think one of the pieces, A, is to be familiar with clinical guidelines uh, and knowing the literature on um, what uh, sorts of gaps in adherence to clinical guidelines. And I think there's this broader kind of like psychological, sociological issue around where um, there's been literature to support this, that uh, folks are willing to admit that health inequities exist, but they don't want to believe that they exist within their own practices or health systems or what have you. And so uh, taking a look to the extent that it's available, and I think now the proliferation of kind of big data, uh, looking within your own healthcare system, looking within your own practice at the EHR data and uh, digging into the outcomes uh, for your patients, for the patients being seen uh, at your facility and having an understanding of where those uh, disparities even are. I mean, that's step one. And I think many places have not done that yet because of this kind of idea that like, oh, disparities are just something that exists everywhere and nowhere at the same time. They, they can't possibly be happening here. I think there's kind of this perception that academic medical centers uh, don't have disparities because they're this kind of tertiary centers where people can get the highest quality care. And that's certainly true, but not everybody has access to academic medical centers. And even within them, there is still uh, profound issues and who can get access to um, what our contemporary standards of evidence are. So first, understanding where those gaps are and then really digging into the structural reasons why that may be the case. And I think, I mean, you gave a really clear example of one patient not being, um, just the clinical trial wasn't even offered to her uh, from her providers. So I think even just thinking about what types of treatments that we're offering and bringing up to patients is. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for that. Like engaging in that process of reflexivity, like am, am I offering clinical trials to all of my metastatic patients or what have you? Am I offering it half the time? Am I offering it half the time systematically? Do I make uh, perceptions about who I think is likely to enroll in a clinical trial or things like that? I mean, specifically on that topic, research has shown that when people of color and Black people are asked about clinical trials, they're just as likely to participate uh, as uh, white folks. And so a big problem is that they're not being asked to, to start with. And that was certainly manifested in uh, the interviews that I had done myself. Well, thank you for that. Um, but I could keep you literally a probably for hours longer, um, just to, to answer some of these questions. But um, we are out of time and we want to be respectful of everyone's time. So Dr. Um, Ruberson, thank you so much for just taking the time to be here with us today. Um, I hope that 
everyone who tuned in was inspired to take action on closing the disparity gaps that we see in our country. So um, you will all be receiving an email shortly after our presentation wraps up today with a link to complete a quick survey. We would really appreciate it if you could just spend a few moments to provide us with your thoughts and feedback about today's program because they do help us plan future programs and fireside chats. After completing the survey, you can enter to win a prize pack filled with goodies from the Masonic Cancer Center. And as for the $5 Amazon e-gift cards that were promised to every live attendee, we did need to change things up a bit for security reasons. So everyone who tuned in today will be entered into a drawing to win a $25 Amazon gift card. So keep an eye on your email because two lucky attendees will receive a $25 Amazon e-gift card. And then join us for our next fireside chat in recognition of colorectal cancer awareness month in just a little under a month away on Wednesday, March 15th from 1 to 2 p.m. We will be joined by University of Minnesota researcher, Dr. Subri Subramani um, for the latest on um, colorectal cancer research at the University of Minnesota and also hear from colorectal cancer survival uh, survivor, Mike Neeson. So mark your calendars because you don't want to miss that. And then please follow the Masonic Cancer Center on all of our social media platforms to stay up to date on future programs and events from the Office of Community Arts and Engagement. Thanks again, everyone, for joining. Hope to see you all soon. Um, have a great rest of your day. And thank you again, Dr. Maya Robertson, for being here today. Take care, everyone.